for this invitation. Uh, so yes, it's going to be a little more statistics. And uh, I will present you a very uh, uh, large work that we've been doing with uh, my group and, and uh, the ICM group uh, of uh, the INRIA team Aramis. Right, so uh, most of you are very familiar with computational anatomy, so I will not go into details, but go back to the fundamentals. We will introduce geometrical objects, we will introduce deformation, deformation that will act on these objects, and uh, the, the goal we want is to really understand the variation, the geometrical variation of shapes, images, lines, whatever object you have, among a population, and that uh, deformation vari geometrical variation will be characterized thanks also to a representative element. And that representative element is really crucial. And the, the next uh, step is also to quantify this geometrical variability so that you can separate populations. So we started, of course, with the uh, default bundle template model of Grenander uh, a few years ago, which um, gave several um, project lines. How do you uh, construct your deformation? What kind of deformation do you want to use? So that was a first part that has been deeply uh, traded by uh, Joan, Alain, uh, and so on. What is the representative element that I was talking about and how do you quantify the geometric variability of a population and can you actually learn that from a population that you know? So the first solution we proposed was um, to learn from statistical model. So we started from the, the Grenander's model and then we put an envelope around with statistics so that we introduce also the uh, way that we, the, the, the ability to learn from a population, the variability that is given inside this statistical model. Right, so what was the first uh, model? The first model was based on, first you have a single observation per patient. Then you want to deal with whatever data you are given images, shapes, lines, fibers, whatever. You want also to be able to use deformation that are simple or more constrained like diffeomorphic deformations. And you want also to deal with populations that are not homogeneous and probably introduce mixture models. So with all these constraints, we end up with, oops, the very first generative statistical model, which was in the Bayesian setting, which is the following. So, uh, is this the pointer? Up. Okay, maybe I can also do that. <laughs> right, so my single, let's say, image observation per subject is something up to a noise that is close to my template with a specific deformation. This deformation is parameterized so that we can deal with it with a computer. And this parameter, this geometric parameter, has also a given uh, probability distribution that we assume to be centered, of course, at the mean mean element, which would be my template, all deformation should average to zero, but with a full covariance matrix which will tell us how things are moving um, together, right? So as I told you, we wanted to deal with many observation, different templates. Ah, ça marche pas ça? Okay. <laughs> ah, continuer. No, ça marche pas. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, this is what we've done. So, we've done it for uh, gray level images, diffusion, functional images, coupling of, of, of the previous ones. 
We estimated templates like gray level images or also probability, probability maps that gives you, for example, for the brain, probability at each location of gray matter, white matter and CSF. That is important to deal with um, voxels that are not, which, which do not have a single uh, uh, tissue in it, which is a um, partial volume effect. We also handled different deformations and heterogeneous population. Great, we were happy, well almost. We were happy with that but that was assuming a, a very strong constraint on the population. I only have one image per subject, so doing cross-sectional analysis. This cross-sectional analysis means that my assumption is that all the person I'm looking at at that time are exactly at the same evolution of the disease or aging or growth, whatever. But if you look at Alzheimer's disease that I will talk about in a moment, people at let's say 72 are 72, correct? But they may have started the disease 10 years or 15 years before with an other uh, dynamic than some other people that you can have in your data set. What does it mean? It means that when you do the cr this cross-sectional analysis with a single image per patient, you are in the variability accounting for geometrical variability, which is the real geometry of the brain, but also the time variation of the disease that affects also people. So that was not a good idea. So we had to move forward. This is why we started learning uh, the kind of same equivalent things for longitudinal data. So what are longitudinal data? Here I have several observations per subject. Again, I want to handle everything. And my, what will be my atlas now? It will be the representative trajectory of the disease, of the phenomenon that I'm looking at. And I'm also learning the population variability in space and time. How do we do that? So here is a longitudinal data set, for example. So I have several subjects. Each, each of them have several here scans. And these are of different numbers per subject and not at the same time either. Okay, so I have, like in real life. So, how do you learn a representative trajectory from this kind of data set? If you look at the literature, there are many things that have been done, for uh, example, for drug injection, for pharmacological analysis, but the key point was that you have the temporal marker of progression. Example, when the uh, uh, medicine well, when the drug has been injected that is the starting point other example uh, could be uh, birth oh, or conceptions for fetal pathology right you have a seed point time point that enables you to first register in time then register in space when you do that, well, basically it's regression and if you want to go to the literature, the seminal paper is from Laird and Ware and they were using linear mixed effect model. Mixed effect model was the model, the, the kind of model we already used before, so that was a good thing that people were also for longitudinal data focusing on those kind of uh, specific models. Right, we do not have this temporal marker. I don't know when the cadences start. I don't know when the Alzheimer's disease starts. So I have to deal with this. And this makes me think that this first temporal then geometrical regression that I've done cannot be done separately and have to be done at the same time. So I have to learn this spatial distribution in a single way. And of course, we will have to pay attention to, I have, if I have two images, do they belong to the same trajectory later in time? 
or do they belong to two different trajectories? Because there is a difference in shape, right? So we will have to pay attention to this uh, issue. And the next one, the next issue is that everything in the literature was vector valued and we want to deal with manifold value data so that we can do things on shapes, on images, on fibers, on whatever kind of data you're giving me, right? Okay, so what is now our model? This is my manifold. So I assume here I have two patients. This one got three scanned, this one got four in time, right? And what I want to find from these data, hopefully I have more than two, is this red line that will be my representative trajectory. What hypothesis did we make on this? We, we, we said that this representative trajectory is a geodesic on this Riemannian manifold. Why? easy to parameterize, right? As soon as you have the metric on the manifold, you have your geodesic easily, well, almost. Now, from this geodesic, how do you have the trajectory of a single patient? First, you have this vector vi that is orthogonal to the v0, which codes for the geodesic, that gives you a, geode um, uh, a geodesic, a blue geodesic here, that is actually the shooting of the point P0 all along, well, in direction VI. This gives you something close to the first green dot. And then what you do, you tr parallel transport these VI along the geodesic so that at any time J, you get the vector Vij, which is the parallel transport of Vi at, at point Pij, right? And you do your shooting again, which gives you another approximation of this green dot. This enables you to reconstruct this green line, which is exactly given here, the tr parallel transport of Vi <coughs> sorry, at time T0, and then you do this curve. So this is one single patient. You have another one with another VI. But as I told you before, people are not uh, sharing the same dynamic. So we also introduce a re time reparametrization. This poor guy first started earlier and then moves faster. So this is why what you observe is actually someone running on this green line, but with its own dynamic, right? So the person evolves along here with its own dynamic. So, right, so um, is it enough to get what we want? Well, yes, we have a full statistical model, hello, here, uh, that gives us the representative trajectory as the geodesic. The spatiotemporal variation, spatial variation are given by all the VIs, temporal variation by all the VIs. And in order to avoid this uh, issue that we had to find whether it was on the same curve or not, we had just to impose this geometric condition of orthogonality. In statistics, it gives the identifiability of the model. In, in geometry, it gives you the complete uh, uniqueness of the uh, uh, parametrization. So what we have here is that we did simple things, but uh, that you can easily understand. The, the, the dynamic is just a time shift and acceleration factor per person, meaning that either you started earlier or later, and you go faster or slower, but that's it. There's no change in dynamics a long time. Right, so if I summarize, I have for each person an acceleration factor, a time shift, and a space shift, characterizing time and space the variability. On these 
uh, elements, since they are individual dependent, they are random effects that I assume to have a certain, uh, a certain uh, distribution. And what I want to estimate are my parameter, which are the fixed effect, these codes for the geodesics, and those are the parameters of the uh, random effects, giving me the spatio-temporal variability inside the population. Right, this is the model. So I like it because you saw previously that I had three lines. I have a little more than three lines, but it's exactly the same principle. I do observe this and I want to get those, not knowing what's in between. Right, so there, there were actually other works, in particular what you can think about instead of this parallel transport of VI along the red curve, the geodesics, and shoot along uh, with respect to those vectors, you can think of I have VI, I shoot, and then I parallel transport V0 along this blue line and shoot again. Could be. Okay? Unfortunately, in this situation, you cannot really easily characterize the, the geometrical dynamic at any time point. With our framework, if you have a Gaussian distribution here, VI, with a specific sigma, you know exactly what is the distribution at time j, uh, p, well, p, at point pij on my geodesics, thanks to the parallel transport. So you completely know the distribution along the geodesic, right? which you cannot do easily on the other case. Okay, so other comparison with a uh, previous word. This is the Laird and Ware model, and this is ours with uh, uh, the, the, the Riemannian manifold that you all know, which is the real line. Uh, so the only difference is that they do have a linear model. We don't, since AI and, and Tau I are multiplied, right? And it's a kind of a different point of view. Here T0 is known and you try to understand what happens at T0. Here T0 is unknown. What we expect is to understand the dynamic with respect to the uh, the, the, the order, um, well, this B, B bar point, and to know where the T0 happens, right? Okay, examples. Examples, well, move to a slightly more complicated Riemannian manifold. Zero one, not that much difficult, okay? But you will see why we like it. So uh, we took as geodesic, well, we wanted the geodesic to be logistic curves, right? So the metric is easy to get, and the model is just of this kind. Why did we want to have this specific model? Because we wanted to use, actually not 0, 1 itself, but 0, 1 to certain power, n, here, 4, for evolution of cognitive scores. So, for example, Cognitive scores belongs to 0, 1 and evolves like this shape, which is a logistic, no, lo no loss, then, well, aging people start to lose their cognitive scores and then either they are dead or they don't have any cognitive score anymore. <laughs> right, so we wanted to study this kind of shapes for several of them. And so Another point was we wanted the model to be like a prop propagation. The first scores, the first score, sorry, happens to increase, and then later the second one, and when with another delay, the third and fourth one. And this was the parametric family of geodesic we wanted to consider. And if you look at the parallel uh, transport of this. Uh, with a vector vi, what happens is that you switch or you change the delay between the curves, right? So this is exactly what we wanted to say. One person, well, the average person is, be, is behaving this way, but a single person may have a shorter 
delay here or larger and maybe the red and this light blue will switch with the red score being higher than the blue one. Okay, so this is something that really tr uh, translated into math the medical assumption that we were given. Okay, how do you do the parameter estimation now? We have a vector of observation. You have these hidden variables that are coding for spatial and temporal variability and all these parameters that you want to estimate. Who? Maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood, easy, almost, with EM, because you are in a mixed effect model. Your complete likelihood is something that you can characterize thanks to the distribution you draw in your uh, 10 lines of models. The question is here. But if you do the, e, the, the usual EM, I think Gersand uh, already talked about that, if you have a curved exponential family, which is our case, you can compute the update of the parameter, so it's going to be a sequential optimization, just maximizing this quantity, which only involves the expectation of my sufficient statistics x with respect to this conditional distribution. Right, conditional distribution is not easy to compute, so we had to move to something to replace it. The first step was to consider the stochastic approximation EM from De Lyon, Laviel and Moulin and say, well, can we just try to sample from this conditional distribution and use this sample with a stochastic approximation and fall into something that we know very good, well, in a, in a very nice way, the convergence of stochastic approximation. That was a solution that we cannot even apply because we had no way to sample from this distribution. So we started introducing with Estelle Kuhn uh, another way of thinking, is to say introduce instead of, hello, instead of sampling a single element from this distribution that you cannot sample from, use a Monte Carlo Markov chain method to do a single step of your Markov chain and use the coupling dynamic of this Markov chain evolution and EM evolution to converge. Good. Well, that we can do. And I think Jason gave you some examples of MCMC methods this morning or, well, take the one you like, the, the one you prefer, and then do, you, do your uh, work. That is interesting, but we had a very uh, difficult problem that, uh, that is always uh, happening in any uh, optimization, except convex optimization, but non-convex optimization problem. You never reach a global maximum. You have uh, convergence toward local maxima. So the question was, can we go a little step further? Yes. And how do you do that? Well, you're not sampling from the true one, the true conditional distribution, but from something that gets closer and closer to your conditional distribution as your iteration goes to infinity. Example. I don't know how to sample from this. Well, I know how. Sorry, I know how to sample from. Uh, uh, I know to sample a Markov chain that has this distribution and stationary distribution, but also know to sample a Markov chain that has this distribution to a certain power, like tempering. So Q tilde could be a tempered version of this, with a temperature converging to one. Okay? And what happens? Well, it happens that, like for simulating annealing, if you have a temperature that first oscillates and then slowly converges to one with oscillation, you most of the time, with a very high probability, actually we didn't quantify it yet, but it, this is still Juliette working on it, we reach the global maximum. So that was a good thing. So all of this was theoretically 
proven that it converges and, well, almost surely, and has uh, normal asymptotic behavior. So everything works exactly the same as the usual SAEM, whatever distribution you put in Q tilde. Good. So if you remember, I had those nice curves, and you could ask, what does it mean? We took the um, ADMI database. The ADMI database is a publicly available, uh, freely available database on the Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, American, I guess, um, American um, government project. So we took the neuropsychological test at ASCOG from this ADMI. So neuropsychological tests are testing the loss of memory concentration, practice, and language, right? And we took 248 subjects who were, at the beginning of the study, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, but sometimes along their uh, study, well, their uh, visit to the neurologist, they were diagnosed ID, Alzheimer's disease. In average, we had six time points per subject, and we choose the logistic propagation model. And this is what we got at the end of the day. So, for us it was nice, and for the neurologist it was also nice, because for the neurologist, the critical value for the, this score is around 0.3, and so we could say that at around 72, in this population, people start to be diagnosed AD, and this is the way they lose memory, then five years later, it's concentration, ten years later, praxis and language. But we also have this, the, the, the time variation among this population. So you have here the slow progressor and the fast progressor, We've learned also the early and late patients. And we also had, if you remember, the opportunity to know how those curves were switching, for example, for some of the uh, people in the population. And what we find out is that basically the two blue, so memory and concentration, are always performing together as well as the two um, um, red and green curves. So basically, memory and, and concentration are highly correlated, and practice and language as well, right? Okay, if you want to compare with available softwares, you can use Monolix. So Monolix is, uh, in this case, in the logistic case, in 1D, is easy to use. Uh, you go to the Monolix uh, web page and it's freely available also for academia. And you perform your, uh, your estimation. You can also use TAN, which is another free, uh, freely available software which uses Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling, if I remember correctly. So these are the results. And what is interesting if you use a synthetic example is that here are the true values and this is our performances and the two others. So, Monolix is the one that goes faster, but it's not that much satisfying, right? Okay, can we say something else about our results? The question for Alzheimer's is, uh, does the people starting earlier have a more aggressive disease? So, let's say, we plot here for every patient the time shift and log acceleration factor and see what happens. And we know that we have the diagnosis, the age of diagnosis, since in the database we have the la last consultation MCI and the first AD1. Okay, so we took the average of the two uh, dates. So here happens that, well, we have well separated be between uh, on early onset and late onset, if you look at the color, the blues on the, on the left and the purple on the right. But is more, what is more interesting is that this left, up left, upper left corner 
is more blue. And the blues are not here, all the blues are not there. Okay, so most probably early Alzheimer's are aggressive Alzheimer's. Okay, so you can say, okay, you, you've, did that, you've done that on uh, 4D, uh, can you do a little more? Yes. This is the comparison, again, between AD and controls uh, for their... Um, Ah, cortical thickness, cortical atrophy, right? So we registered, we estimated the cortical atrophy for every patient, and this is what we end up with to compare the two populations. So what you can see, there's, there is a difference in acceleration between the two, okay, the two average curves, and difference in time shifts, time shifts as well. And what is more interesting is that you can also find differences between controls and MCI. The MCI are those that we don't know if they will convert or not. Okay, so that was, well, this is the most critical population. Right, can we do a little more complex shape? Yes, we also did on graph propagation. So same kind of model, the only difference is that we estimate on the cortical graph what is the evolution, well, the, the shape of atrophy, and if you go into the detail, this is every five years, the shape of atrophy of the cortex, okay? So this is also uh, same model, same algorithm, just change the manifold, okay? And we did another step, which is, okay, here we are uh, focusing on geodesic on a manifold. A geodesic on a manifold, is good to describe something that is evolving in a single way. What about a treated disease? Treated disease, treated pathology, you have the disease progression and then if you have the treatment, at some point after the treatment, the patient hopefully starts to react, right? For example, tumor is growing, and then with chemotherapy or t angiogenic, you go to uh, decrease in volume, right? So you cannot deal with that with a single geodesic. So what we've done is to go to piecewise geodesic. Piecewise geodesic, so here imagine is my template shape. So the trajectory, this is time. And in red, you have how things tend to evolve for this average trajectory, right? So, meaning that the guy is mostly waving, okay, like this. So this is not a unique geodesic because you are exactly doing one thing and it's exact inverse. Right, and the blue uh, arrows are giving you the specific deformation of a single uh, person, which here is something for him to dance, and in blue, with the parallel transport, something that is waving a little more than the template one, okay? So, if you go to this special temporal piecewise trajectory, you can deal with many different kind of other pathology. Here, for example, for treated cancer, you uh, compute the evolution of the volume of the tumor, and at some point the tumor starts to be resistant to the drug, and the patient says it says to be to escape from the treatment, and then what you want to estimate is the average escape and the individual escape given the trajectory, well, first element of trajectory of this patient, right. Okay, so this is the result um, for a real data set on the uh, resist core. Uh, resist scores, it, it's, it's not a good way to call it, but uh, <laughs> it's with a C, not with an S. <laughs> resist scores is, is uh, for a radiologist they uh, segment the five biggest tumors, lesions, on a scan, and they sum their volumes. 
So each dot here, for this example, this yellow person, each dot is for this person a different scan, okay, where the radiologist has computed his resist score. So here is the average behavior with respect to a given antiangiogenic therapy for a metastatic cancer. So here a patient with metastatic cancer of the kidney, starting from kidney, well it's metastatic now, and uh, you have one antiangiogenic that has a certain delay before acting, this is in days, and then when it acts it quite it's quite uh, fast, and, but if you look at here, when you start being resistant, then you have a high escape, right? Okay, in this kind of study, we also see if there were a um, correlation between the acceleration factor of the first dynamic and the second dynamic, because we have two dynamics, two temporal dynamics on each geodesic, so you have piecewise geodesic, each geodesic has, well, the guy can run on the first one and slow down on the second one, okay? So here we saw some correlations and we of course did it also for other, other, can you see something? Yes. Other kind of data, because you can say that, again, you're not satisfied with uh, just uh, 1D elements. This is a shape here, extra, uh, so this is uh, mimicking the evolution of a tumor, so it's, it's uh, in loop, flattened and shrinking. Okay, so same thing, it works the same way. Right? Okay, and what do we want to do with this tool? We want to use it as a predictor. Since we have this average trajectory, which is piecewise or not piecewise, when someone comes, we can, well, someone here, we can see where this guy is with respect to the trajectory in time and space, and we can extra, um, extrapolate to find what will be his state in a certain number of time. Okay? We did this for Alzheimer's disease and uh, for about a year after the last scan we took into account in the, in the learning uh, uh, phase, we were able to reach a prediction that was below the noise, the, the noise of uh, registration, of, um, of uh, acquiring the image. So that was quite good. <laughs> right, so I think I'm just on time. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to present today was uh, a way to deal with longitudinal data in a very generic fashion. Whatever data you have, as, is, as soon as you know the manifold you want them to fall in, everything goes straight forward. Okay? So this is really important and... Sorry. And what is interesting also is that you can separate both the geometrical variability, which is very the sh which makes the shape varies along uh, along the way, to the dynamical situation, people may differ from dynamic and not from shape, and you want that to be taken into account, right? Or the other way around. So, for the moment, we used it first to learn uh, how patients were behaving and we want to use that for prediction now and future work is to extend this to well textured data of course images with a texture can we deal with that we were talking about geodesic registration metamorphosis of another 
interesting thing for cancer because metastatic cancer are given, well, are defined by the fact that lesions appear or, well, never disappear, but appear. So we have a change, oops, we have a change in uh, topology, so we will have to deal with that as well. And mixture of all of these, of course, because population are never homogeneous. So this and that are actually uh, already in the pipeline. This one is for real future work. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much.